everyone, and welcome to the 23rd episode of the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, a podcast all about the subject of antinatalism created by antinatalists. My name is Amanda Oldfans Sukunik, also known as Forever Wolf Films on YouTube, and today I'm speaking with the infamous cultural hijacking, megaphone wielding, London based street performer, and antinatalist and vegan activist, social experimentalist, better known as Danny Shine. Don't honor your parents. Take them to court. Sue your parents for having you without your consent. <laughs> yes, your parents had you without your consent. They didn't think it through properly. Then obviously, if obviously they can't get your consent, which is why they shouldn't have had you. Uh, so welcome, Danny. Thank you so much for being my guest today on Exploring Antinatalism. It's my pleasure. It's good to be here. It's good to have you. Um, so let me start out uh, sort of simply just by asking you a few basic questions about yourself. In your words, who is Danny Shine and what is it that you do? <laughs> <laughs> who is Danny Shine is, a, I think it's probably, I'm never going to get to the bottom of that. Um, what it is that I do, again, that's a difficult question to answer. Um, I have been speaking in public for 12 years, actually for longer than that. I started in Speaker's Corner. Yeah. Um, about 16 years ago and uh, then I 12 years I met up with a guy called Charlie Beach and we did some yeah. megaphoning he had a megaphone I had a sign and we did some megaphoning together and uh, that only lasted about three months and then after that I went off on my own and I've been doing it ever since I've got really hooked on it um, and I go into public spaces and challenge um, what's going on there I, for many, many years, I've been challenging um, things like uh, consumerism yeah. and, then, uh, and, and uh, authoritarianism, statism, challenging all those things. And then I became vegan as a result of my son, who's at the time is only about seven years old. And, yeah. um, and then somehow I stumbled across antinatalism, uh, having had three children. And uh, in yeah. fact... Um, it was only two or three years ago when they were the, the two older ones were in their, already in their twenties, roughly, and yeah. the younger one was about ten when I when I discovered this antinatalism, and it's become very compelling, and yeah. I'm quite an obsessive character, <laughs> and I've become really, really obsessed with it. Um, yeah. So uh, and so now it seems more important than anything else that I do, and I fuse most of my performances with some kind of. A connection to antinatalism not all but uh, most of them I do yeah 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 it's amazing uh you know having watched sort of your progression a little bit going back and watching the history and seeing it become you know more and more of a dominant uh subject within what you do um I didn't realize that you had been doing this for so long I know you've done it a long time but 16 years I didn't realize um can I ask, like, when the video element started being introduced to sort of what you do? Like, when did you actually start, you know, filming yourself? Or when did other people start filming you, you know, at, yeah, in your that performances? Was around two th yeah, around 2009. Okay. Um, yeah, so 11 years ago. And you started that on YouTube, or were you posting anywhere else at the time? Or did yeah, you... it started on YouTube. No. Okay, okay. It started on YouTube, and it started on Charlie Beach's um, channel, he put all the stuff on his channel and I was a bit naive and I just let that happen. And, and then I started my own channel and I've been quite far behind him. I mean, I don't really look what he's got, but he's got a lot of subscribers Yeah. Um, on the back, on the back of what we did together, which is fine. Um, yeah. And, and I've got my own channel and yeah, that, that trundles along. Right. Right. Yeah. And it's doing quite well. You just recently hit 50,000 subscribers over that amount. So congratulations yeah. on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have seen some of that older work with, uh, with Charlie Veach. Um, just for the sake of our audience that might not be familiar, can you explain what Speaker's Corner is? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Speaker's Corner is a place in London in Hyde Park um, where every Sunday people gather and they have the opportunity to talk with each other about whatever they want to talk about. There's a lot of religious people there. Yeah. I went there when I many years ago w with with a sign that said "Don't believe anyone, including me," um, <laughs> and then developed my and then developed my public speaking uh, skills there. Really, over many many years, um, and and that's what it is. I mean, 
and, and I realised that, you know, it shouldn't be just there, that you're allowed to speak, uh, where, let's say wherever you want, that should be anywhere. So I took it around, took it out and took it to the streets. Okay, I see. Yeah, I wish every place had a place like Speaker's Corner. It kind of seems like a, an arguer's paradise of sorts. Um, just out of curiosity, has, has what you've, you've done and what you do ever been featured on television? Does the UK have anything similar to sort of like a public access television, you know, that we have here in the United States where, you know, anybody can submit, you know, their videos to television? Do you guys have anything like that? Not no. that I'm aware of. Um, okay, interesting. No, um, the, I, yeah, I mean, I've occasionally flirted with the idea, but I'm not sure whether it's me or whether it's materials a little bit too much for the for mainstream television. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I see. I see. In 2015, I just thought this was really interesting. The Jewels Guide uh, declared that you were one of the top 50 things to go see in London, which is pretty awesome. Um, how did this come about? And did it have any impact on, you know, people that follow your activities? Did more people follow you after this uh, aired or premiered? Yeah, I, I don't know, um, to be honest. And one of the things that I still haven't been able to organise is, which I would like to do in the future, yeah. is more more collaboration with people. But I yeah. love doing it so much that I just get on my bike and go for it every day or maybe every other day. And what I need to do is to sit down and get involved with some people and get more organised and get some projects off the ground, yeah. which I, we've spoken about many times before. Of course. Right, right, right. But I'm still thinking about it, and how I, I still think about it a lot, and I'm perhaps we'll talk about it a little bit later in the conversation. Yeah, definitely. I'd love to talk about that that, uh, that stuff, all the projects that you have in mind. Um, I mean, just had, so you know, just to get a sense of sort of your process, it is quite spontaneous. Then, like when you go out, like you don't really make a plan per se. Is that true? No. Yeah, yeah. I just go out, and whatever comes into my mind, I talk about. Um, I've been doing a lot of making fun of the COVID situation yeah. and, and weaving, weaving in the antinatalism to those performances as well. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Um, do you go out on the street with the intention to convince people or do you just want people to, you know, um, sort of revel in the spectacle of what you do to go away thinking about what you've said? Um, do you feel as though you have convinced a lot of people of the things that you're saying? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, uh, we're... I, I think um, that, that antinatalism is an idea that is very simple, but it is, it, but it is, uh, it's fighting against, you know, every, you know, it, it's fighting against our very own DNA, uh, the, yeah. our programming. It's against our programming, our nature. It's against nurture. It's against everything. It, it opposes everything, and therefore, you know to think that someone in the street with a megaphone is going to change people's minds on this issue like that is a bit deluded. Having said that, I'm, you know, I, um, I'm sure that there are, there are some people who have started to think differently about it. Yeah. Um, as a result of maybe partially as a result of seeing what I've, what I have to say about it. Um, firstly, secondly, a lot of what I do, a lot of my experience over the last 12 years is that I'm not, not, I'm not only, I'm, I don't get up there to try and persuade people and, yeah. you know, that's yeah. not really what it's about, right? I get up there to create some interesting theatre yeah. from which questions come and, you know, to challenge people. Um, and a lot of people, I mean, not, not the majority by far, certainly a very small minority, but there are very small minority of people, or maybe not very small. I think one of the things that um, people like about what I do is that they, they would imagine that it takes a lot of courage and they would love to do it yeah. themselves, but they couldn't. And, um, and so, they, and so they, they get some solace from the fact that there, is, there are other people out there that are mm -hmm. seeing the same things um, and are prepared to say so in public. So it's not just about convincing other people. It's about um, giving people, I don't know, I don't, I don't like to call it hope because it's not really hope. It's not a very hopeful uh, ideology, but certainly giving people some comfort yeah. in the knowledge that they're not alone, you know, as well as make them feel, you know, a lot of people... I mean, someone said to me today, I've been, I've been in, in Brighton, south, south of England, and someone said to me today, you know, that they... That they heard that I was going to be here and they came specially because and, and that the, the watching the videos that I've been putting out in the last few months has really helped them 
through yeah. that time um, because it puts a smile on their faces. It, it's quite good for depression. <laughs> Watching I, the videos or, or coming or come. Yeah, oh. or, or, or even coming. And one of the things that I would like to do, many things, is I'd like to offer people the chances to come and see, um, to tell them where I'm going to be more often. Yeah. So that they can come and see and have, a, and have an experience. It, I mean, I was doing it just now. I mean, watching, when you're there watching it, it's quite different because the camera can't catch everybody's reaction. But if you're there watching it, it's watching other people's reactions that are just so incredible. Yeah, um, I can imagine. You almost need some sort of app, I feel. Like, you know, like, Danny's going to be live yeah. over here. Yeah, I'd love to see something like that. I'd love, I'd love to develop an app with all, all sorts of, there's all sorts of things that I had an idea of developing yeah. apps and things um, for, for all the projects that I have in mind. But and that comes then, I mean, again, we can speak about this later, but then it comes to the, I've got, I've got this sort of two minds. On the one hand, I think that antinatalism could do with, um, big names, um, mm. young people, and big and money to yeah. to create a really good brand um, and to play the game that they're playing mm -hmm. with antinatalism. Um, and you know, with that, then I, I I have loads and loads of ideas of things we could do with the money. Um, yeah, if that's the way to go. Yeah. And then another part of me thinks, no, it's better to do it with just volunteering and maybe there's a fusion that could be done. I don't know. It's very difficult. Um, but yeah. I don't think it has it. I don't think there's yet really good solid place for people to go to understand about it. That's really well designed, a well designed website and a branding. You know, quite a lot of your content is aimed at police and various uh, authority figures. Um, you have this brilliant way, I think, of catching authority figures in these like rambling, nonsensical narratives that they spin as to why you're wrong and why you must obey. You know, like desperately trying to get you to comply with laws that, like, oftentimes it's it's quite clear as you reveal that they barely understand themselves, um, and it just reveals the absurdity mm. of their dedication to all this law and order for the sake of what you know shopping <laughs> you know in, in a lot of these areas that you're performing in, in these big shopping areas um and i mean you you can see the exasperation <laughs> of what you're doing you know causes these people and it's it's quite glorious i don't know what else to say um and uh, and you do it fearlessly like this you know this naughty little imp <laughs> and it's 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 quite amazing to watch um so considering this, I have to ask, I mean, what is the most amount of trouble you've gotten into? Um, you, you know, it, sometimes it does almost okay. feel like you're poking, I, I'm, I'm gonna poking first, the hornet's nest, you know? Yeah, I, I'll come to that in a second, but I'm just going to first um, wanted to share something with you. I don't know if I can express this well, but um, that something I became aware of um, and only recently yeah. to articulate it like this, and that is that the way I see life at the moment is that we're basically just a bunch of chimps mm -hmm. with, you know, with the ability to feel compassion and the ability to see into the future and the ability to, to be aware of our own mortality. But we're actually just a bunch of chimps being run by DNA and DNA basically is DNA's goal, so to speak, is to get us to reproduce yeah. whatever way it can. Right. And, and so much of our behavior even if we're not reproducing, even if we've gone past the age of reproducing, even if we've been sterilized, yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, much of our, so, so much of our behavior, some would say even all of it, is driven by this DNA. And in a way, what I came to, to see, and I don't know if I'm right about this, but it's just an analysis of myself. And sometimes I think I should do a film like this. Mm -hmm. the, the way I see myself and the police is basically, it's all the same. It's all chimp behavior. It's all like yeah. me being the chimp going, ooh, you know, all, all the, all the megaphoning is me going, go, ooh, 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 look at me, you know, so that I can, <laughs> okay. it's like a mating call. Yeah. Right. And me, me with the police is just basically chimps trying to get higher up on the, on the hierarchy. I'm trying to get one over them. They're trying to get one over me. Yeah. And it's all just chimp behavior. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, um, in terms of how much trouble I've got into, um, well, I've been in, in, I've been locked up a few times, um, maybe five or six times, just wow. overnight or just for a few hours. Um, I've been prosecuted a few times. I've been yeah. found guilty once, but then I got that overturned, so I don't have a criminal record, um, which is great. Yeah. Um, 
And considering what I do, um, which is quite provocative, um, I think it's, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm quite appreciative of the fact that, that I've not got a criminal record. Yeah. The, law, the, legal, the legal system is, you know, is, is, is nasty yeah. uh, in, lots of, in lots of ways. Um, so I'm grateful for that. Um, and having said that, I kind of, I kind of now, now that I'm, I mean, antinatalism has totally changed my whole outlook on everything. Yeah. It, it's really transformed everything and made everything that I've done look a lot less significant compared to antinatalism. So, um, you know, I, I still continue to upload videos of the police mm -hmm. and I think it's all right. I mean, I think, I, I mean, you know, there are lots of people doing lots of, there are lots of people who, who are exposing authorities for what they are, right? There are lots of people doing that, but there are not a lot of people speaking about antinatalism. Yeah. And therefore I kind of look at that stuff. I mean, I, I upload the stuff about the police, um, but I, I nearly always these days put a little, you know, a little antinatalism in there somewhere. So for example, yeah. I just posted, the, I think today I posted one, yeah? And I started, I started with, you know, with a screen that says, is there a problem that antenatal can, cannot solve, mm. right? And then I had the police doing what they're doing. So to, so to me, you know, this whole police thing is so insignificant compared to the, 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 the story of, of reproduction, which, you know, which solves every problem. I appreciate what you're saying. I, I do I do think that the other work that you do is important, but I also I also think you've graduated to to the biggest authority to go up against. You know, DNA is the biggest policeman. So I can I definitely understand yeah. what you're saying essentially. Yeah, that you know, all the other Goliaths don't seem so tall now. Um but regardless, it's still the bit you know, those those other monsters are still a big part of the world we live in and it's important to have every voice yeah. against against those so yeah uh, you know and it's fun as well it's also good yeah. fun and uh yeah. it's exciting and i'm you know i'm i've got the mind for it and i'm quite good at it yes, um, yes you are and you know and these uh, you know and to be fair uh the you know po police the police are following the orders of of governments governments yeah. are corrupt they're following the orders of god knows who and um, they're following these orders without question. And, you know, they, they deserve to be challenged and yeah. deserve to be mocked. Absolutely. I agree. Um, do you feel like you've ever gone too far? <laughs> um, you know, I, I, again, I know some of the inc inc uh, incidents that have befallen you, you know, being taken to court. Um, do you ever feel like you've, you've gone too far or mis misstepped perhaps in any kind of way? <laughs> not really uh, yeah. oh, good. I mean yeah not really it's you know I mean I, th I think I think if I really would be able to make a really big difference I'd probably be stopped <laughs> the only reason why I'm, I'm allowed to carry on because you know they know they can carry on with what they're doing it doesn't make any yeah. difference if some nutter is on a megaphone telling people what might be true uh what would you say is the subject that tends to make people the angriest when you bring it up in public has that been the antinatalism or the veganism i think the antinatalism is, is definitely the one um yeah. because because what what i'm really saying yeah to everyone is i'm i'm getting everyone to question their parents really yeah right you know and and uh, their parents i'm getting everyone to question their own ideas about them being parents um, and you know, it's when you, although they can't necessarily, they don't necessarily aware of what exactly what I'm doing at some level they are aware. So for example, today, you know, a young, maybe she must've been 18 year old yeah. was in the crowd in, here in Brighton. And I said something like, do you think anybody would want you to be their mother? <laughs> yeah. Just absolutely. You know, taken aback. How could I say such a thing? Incensed. <laughs> <Right>? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, so yes, uh, it, it's, it is a very provocative subject, but yeah. I try and do it in a way that's funny. And so yeah. on the whole, it's, um, yeah, on the whole, it's all right. I mean, yeah. it's, it's just tricky when there are a lot of drunk people around Yeah, I can imagine. and, uh, there are, there are more and more of them around in certain areas of London. 
and then I have to sort of really be careful. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, if you don't mind me saying, there are some instances in some of these videos where like, I am scared for you a little bit. Like, I mean, there's, there's one video at speaker's corner and you know, the one guy is telling you to go hang yourself on the tree and Oh yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, you just got like this crowd around you literally acting like chimps pretty much just shouting, yeah. shouting yeah. at the dissenting voice. And it's, uh, it, 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 you know, there definitely is an element of danger to what you, what you do. Well, well, I, I was joking. I was joking actually in speaker's corner this week. And I, and you know, there's certain claims that I make. Um, one of them is that I'm probably, um, have the most contact with the police, uh, Oh yeah, <laughs> the most the system, the most contact in the police in this country, and then secondly, I have the um, unenviable, um, oh, I can't remember what it's called, but the, the unenviable. I mean, the unenviable position of someone who's probably been asked, "Why don't you commit suicide more than anybody in this country?" <laughs> I, I mean, I'd I mean, probably believe that. it. Yeah, you're probably yeah, the antinatalist who's most been asked that in public. You know, maybe Raphael Samuel. Yeah, that's is, right. You know, right. yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So uh, I think that takes care of some of the, some of the basics of what you do. So now let's get into uh, the subject at hand, antinatalism. Um, antinatalism, uh, I mean, you spoke a little bit about this already, but antinatalism is a fairly recent addition to what you do. Um, how did you become interested in the subject of antinatalism and why are you an antinatalist, Danny? So I came across, uh, okay, since since I've been doing the megaphoning, I've met some interesting people. And one of the most interesting people that I've met, um, it, it, I've become very close friends with him. And he is also a father, but he became an, he became an antinatalist without knowing it a long, long time ago. And he spent many years trying to convince his son not to reproduce. And he's managed to succeed, but he doesn't know if, whether he's going to be able to hold on to this idea. Yeah. Uh, anyway, he he and I talk very often, maybe once a day, sometimes for hours. And um, he introduced me to In Mendham, the In Mendham videos, mm -hmm. I think. I'm familiar, um, I think, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I, think it, I think he did that. Um, and um, I can't remember what else, but once I started reading and, and watching this watching Mendham and watching some of the other stuff that's online, yeah. it all started to become very compelling. Now, when you ask why am I an antinatalist, I've thought about this. Um, uh, I made a film why I'm an antinatalist. I didn't put, I, I didn't make it public. I just made it sort of unlisted, but yeah. some people have seen it in the antinatalist community. Um, I think that question can be answered in several ways, but I'm going to answer it in two ways. I think you know, the question, why am I an antinatalist? Sort of, how did I get to be an antinatalist? And then for what reasons am I an antinatalist? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that, the, you know, I, I'm, I'm always, I'm always, to a certain degree, suspicious of my own ideas and mm -hmm. my own mind, because I know that my mind can mislead me and does mislead me on a regular basis. Sure. Um, and, and I think that there is something, in a weird way, there is something bizarrely comfortable about knowing about antinatalism because it kind of answers i'm uh, it answers all of my questions really yeah. i don't yeah. feel yeah yeah um it yeah so it, it's uh, so that's in, in a way that's probably why i'm a i was attracted to it why why i was attracted to the idea because you know, I've always been asking questions about all sorts of things and about life. And now that I now that I can see antinatalism and, it, and all the ideas that surround it, I don't feel I have those questions really anymore. Yeah. Which makes me suspicious still of myself um, because now I, I know that, that I'm going to be experiencing cognitive bias um, to try it and, and everywhere. And, and in fact, what happens is is a result and it is that everything I look at it, it now relates to antinatalism yeah you know, so for example covid you know just yeah. to me that's just another good reason not to bring people into existence Absolutely. for so many reasons no, yeah. no matter what you think is going on yeah if you buy into the to the the mainstream narrative then definitely don't bring ch children in and if you think that it's all a conspiracy then definitely don't bring children in either it's even right. worse right 
Um, so, um, yeah, so I, I can, I'm, I'm aware that it's quite an attractive, um, it's an attractive philosophy in some type of way. It's not, I mean, it's obviously got, it's, you know, there's, there's aspects of it that are very unattractive. Sure. But it's an attractive philosophy because it, because it, 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 feel, it feels like I, a lot of questions have been answered. Yeah. Why am I an anti atheist in terms of like, what, what are the reasons? And, and they are very, there are lots of them. There are many, many reasons. Um, I'm, I'm an antinatalist because um, I think that it's, uh, you're, you're bringing, by, by procreating, and obviously I didn't know this at the time when I had my children, but by procreating, I, what I did was I uh, inadvertently um, brought a whole bunch of needs, wants and desires into existence that weren't there before, that, that have to be, you know, that, that, that each one of my children has spent the rest of, her, of their lives trying to, to satisfy all those needs and desires, that there was no need to create. Yeah. Furthermore, um, that, you know, I, I, by creating a child, I have created, I've taken a huge risk each time, and I, I have no idea about it you know, at the time. I didn't know to think about that because, because you know, because DNA... DNA is so much in, in in the picture at you know at creating the perfect circumstances for us to procreate, and part of it is to divert our attention from what we what what now I see is the absolute crucial questions that should have been asked and yeah. uh, before I did it, um, which is you know you'll take I'd say took a risk you know uh, with my DNA and my wife's DNA. I never even like thought about that. I never thought about yeah. the quality of of the DNA and look back at my and look back at my parents and think. And now I look back at my parents and bless them. They weren't terrible people. They were very good people no. in many many ways. And my dad's still alive, yeah? yeah. And you know he was he lived a decent life and he was a decent guy. But um, but like when I think about it, I hope I hope he'll forgive me for saying like if I thought about it before I had my children, I thought, well, I don't really want to pass on his DNA. He's not, you know, he's not that good. (laughs) Right. And, (laughs) and then if I think about my DNA, I also think to myself, well, I didn't think about that at the time. Do I want to pass on my DNA? Do I want to take a risk with half of my DNA and half of my wife's DNA and goodness knows what can come out. Right. Um, You know, I, 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 what can come out is, you know, they, they could be they could be lovely and they could be wonderful and they could help the world and they could make a difference and they do, and they are all those things. But they could also be, you know, psychopathic, yeah, uh, extremely unwell, um, you know. And uh, and I didn't think about I, I just didn't think about the whole of the fact that I was bringing in a life. I thought I was creating a baby, yeah, right, yeah, which, which is you know, yeah. So. Um, so now that I think about these things, uh, the reason why I wouldn't do it and I wouldn't do it for any money in the world is because I, I t- I'm, I'm taking a risk with somebody else's life. Yeah. It, it's just it's for no good reason. What for? Right. Um, so, uh, so there's, the, there's that, that's, that's another reason. Um, uh, uh, furthermore, it's a, it's a terrible thing for the environment. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know how I fe- even feel about the environment, but it still is. It is really bad for the environment and it's bad for other people as well because, yeah. you know, my child has left, uh, each child has left a whole pile of nappies somewhere and yeah. um, loads of fossil fuels have been burnt. And, um, and you know, two, two of them are, st- no, one, one of them is still uh, eating meat uh, and dairy. Um, and so, so there's the animals that are getting hurt and then there's even animals that are getting hurt by vegans, um, you know, in the field, whatever. Um, so, so everything seems to be harmed by, by bringing someone into existence. So much harm is done uh, by the child um, because we live in a, you know, we live in this exploitative world. Both nature is exploitative and yeah. so is the system. Um, so the child comes in is, is going to experience harm, um, is going to harm others, could seriously harm others, could seriously experience harm. 
And having said all that, I think it's important to point out that, I, that, that, that as, a, as a parent, uh, I've had um, huge amounts of joy and pleasure of yeah. uh, and connection with them. Um, and, you know, and I feel very, very fortunate in, in almost every area of my life. Sure. It could have really been awful. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but having said that, that doesn't really, for me, it doesn't cut in terms of um, the risk that I took yeah. uh, having them. Um, and another thing as a parent that, that I, I have to say is that um, I find their suffering extremely excruciating. I find it oh, yeah. so painful. Sure. Um, you know, and I, and I have to deal with that. And if they watch this, also another problem is like, if they watch this, then they're going to they're gonna conceal it from me. And I don't really want that either. I want to be able to help them if I can. Yeah. Um, but I find it really painful. Um, and I didn't think about it. I just didn't think it through before I, before I, I, I had a child or I had any of them. I didn't think any of these things through. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's a start. You have huge sympathy with everything that you've what just makes said. You, what, what makes you an, an antinatalist? Oh, well, a, a, an, equally, an, an equally long laundry list. Um, so, I mean, I, I think for me, the, the biggest thing is the suffering. And it is both the, suf the, the needs that don't need to be fulfilled in the first place. There's just no need to create uh, new, new life on this planet. And there's no need to create the harm that it's going to create to the things that are already here. Um, and, you know, just in speaking a little bit to what you were saying, um, you know, before what, what, what you were first talking about as far as... Um, you know, just the relief of antinatalism, you know, like there's, you were talking a little bit about how, uh, you know, when you realized these things, it was sort of like all your questions had been answered. And, you know, there's, there's this thing about that's always told to us about life that like, we can't really do anything about how much it sucks or how bad it is. And, um, and when I became an antinatalist, there is a certain sense of relief and there is a certain sense of empowerment that there is something very real that you can do about the suffering in this world is that you can, you can say no to it and you can uh, empower others to also say no to it um, and to, to end it. Like we do get to decide at least on some level, how much suffering there is going to be in the world. Um, and so it just sort of, you know, I, I was planning on saying this sort of a little bit later on, but when I discovered antinatalism, it really was sort of like a lightning strike kind of moment where there was such clarity and there was such relief because yeah, all of these other questions did sort of lose their edge and did sort of lose their, their importance. And it just sort of put so much into focus um, both artistically and just in terms of my own humanity. Um, I've never been like a directionless person in, in the sense of, I mean, in some ways, yes, certainly I have, but in the sense of like, I have lots of terrestrial meaning because I love a lot of things. I'm obsessed by a lot of things. I create a lot of things. I've always made art, but I finally had this other, um, sense of purpose in, you know, I can, I can actually do something I think that is sort of only the only really sort of real significant thing, which is I can, I can prevent all of these other living things from having to go through this. You know, there's, there's no reason for these new beings to have to answer the same questions that it took me so long to find the answers to and all of this pain and misery. Um, and, and obviously, yes, as, as you said, you know, there are parts of this that are very difficult and, and, and not pleasant and uh, you know, but, but I think more than anything, um, I've never found antinatalism to be depressing. I've always found it to be um, this huge sense of relief that there is an answer to what you do about the suffering on planet Earth um, and that there is this possibility of an end to it. Um, and that is so, I mean, joyful is such a, a cliche, trite, you know, ism. Um, but that it does fill me with just such immense joy um that you know we can have the agency for not only ourselves but others that this will this will end one day um and if we do take some control over it um you know we can make sure that the future 
isn't going to be this ridiculously horrible place, that it can be sort of this silent, um, non-suffering filled, um, you know, thing that we look forward to, but don't have to look forward to because nothing's going to be here to experience it. Um, so, I mean, it's a complicated question. I mean, I, I think I've, I've, um, I, I also, as we'll talk later, you know, I, I've, I find antinatalism to be immensely inspiring creatively. Um, and so on a, on a purely sort of personal artistic level too, it's like, I, I, nothing has inspired me more. Um, but I think at the, at the core, it is this solution to suffering that I find the most attractive about it. Um, I've called you an activist a number of times already in, in this, uh, in this interview. Um, and it's hard not to think of you in those terms, but do you consider yourself an antinatalist activist? Would you put that, and, and a vegan activist, would you put that, that term and weight to what you do? Yeah. Um, yeah, I suppose so. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, vegan activists I'm less of because I think, because antinatalism has, has taken over, although I do yeah. speak about veganism, but, um, yeah, so, yeah, I, yeah, I'm an antinatalist activist, I guess so, yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, you answered some of this already, but perhaps, well, we'll see where we can go with the, I mean, where does your antinatalism come from, would you say? Is, is it something that you had inklings of or thought about, you know, before you were exposed to this at all? Um, it was it was really not a big, at big rev- all. not at all. Not at all. Yeah. yeah. Not at really- all. I mean, you know, when I, I was brought up in a, in a, unbelievably natalist pro-natalist environment i mean yeah. it was it, it was I, i'd never met an anti-natalist yeah. i'd never met anybody who didn't want to have children by choice i was brought up in in orthodox jewish home and everyone had children and everyone wanted to have children and those who couldn't have children were poor them it was awful and um you know um yeah. and we had uh, i we had in our community lord robert winston Okay. who um, is a fertility, who's a fertility expert, was made into a lord. He must have created like hundreds, if not thousands of babies and children. Now I look at him and think, oh my God, how awful, how yeah. absolutely awful. But in those times he was considered, I mean, he was made a lord, you know, he was considered the most wonderful man. He'd helped so many people. Yeah. But, what had, but now I look back at it and I see it very, very differently. Right. So I was brought up in very, very pro-natalist world, and which is why I had three children without blinking. Yeah. Um, and I had no idea at all about any of this stuff until I was 50 years old. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, you know, that, re- that is now reminding me what I meant to say uh, beforehand, and maybe I'll just sort of tack it on to the end of the previous part. But, you know, what you're saying about, you know, you didn't think about it, you didn't think about it. I mean, how, how could you have, how could anybody really, you know, I mean, this, this expectation that um, it's so easy to figure out on one's own. I mean, we can look back at our, at how we previously were and, uh, and, and sort of chide ourselves for not figuring it out perhaps, you know, at an earlier stage, but we live in an, in an absolutely oppressively, natalist world, you know, and, and the world does not give the budding antinatalist any tools, you know, um, to sort of figure, figure any of this out. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, there's, you know, there's, I think it's a very oppressed point of view. Um, and, and it's, you know, even though it's an idea that has been with us, you know, since recorded history, essentially, in one form or, or another, um, it's unbelievable that it's taken humanity to get to the point where, you know, there's active antinatal, there's a, there's a word for it. <laughs> you know, it's like the word yeah. antinatalism is, hasn't been around very long at all. Um, so it's, it's really no surprise, you know, that, uh, that people aren't, there's no word that, that aren't, that people aren't coming to it on their own, you know, without some form of being exposed to it or some form of instruction, so to speak. I don't know what else, how to call it exactly. Um, because there's nowhere to put it. I mean, I can say for myself, I had little inklings of procreation being a negative as a kid. Cause I grew up with, you know, obsessed with Frankenstein and Dracula and Frankenstein is obviously a metaphor against procreation, even though it's almost never interpreted that way. And, 
vampires create other vampires. You know, they, the, the harm that one vampire creating another vampire, um, you know, all of this death that comes from the creation of new monsters, essentially, that the vampire creates, uh, is also very, I mean, this, you know, the, 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 it's not difficult to draw a connection to natalism from that. So I remember having those little instances, and I remember ta- trying to, to have those conversations with people, you know, as a young kid, but um, it just gets squashed. You know, it's mental illness. It's, it's uh, you know, a little girl shouldn't be saying these things. We want you to play with dolls and pump out the kids one day. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really no surprise. Um, <laughs> so you've spoken a little bit about this already, but uh, what impact would you say has antinatalism had on your, on your life? As I said you know, earlier, for me, it very much was like being struck by lightning. It was just a, an absolute, you know, reckoning of an event. Well, it's uh, had a huge effect on my life, and as a parent, it's um, it's a very mixed, uh, it's a mixed feelings, a lot of mixed feelings and mixed experiences. Um, as I say now, I look around me, and it, it, you know, I just seem to be gathering more and more evidence yeah. of why it's just, you know, it seems so obvious now uh, as to why we should have a different view of reproduction. Um, so it really has changed a lot. It, as I said before, it, you know, it's, it made me look back at some of what I do. And yes, I do think what I do is, you know, what I've done in the past is valuable because it's to do with our lives here now, but yeah. it, it, it pales into insignificance with the potential of prevent of prevention that you, you were talking about here. It, it's, yeah. um, um, and, and, and in terms of the impact on my on my life, my family life, again, it's tricky. Um, yeah. I don't want to really say too much because it's sure. uh, it's not it's not not my place to do so. But my wife certainly completely opposes my ideas. She just she just will not go there, even though she kind of understands them intellectually, sort of sometimes. Yeah. Um, and, and my children have mixed feelings about it all, and it's particularly hard for my youngest one, who's only 13 now. Um, it's very tricky. And, uh, you know, I make it clear to them that I do not want them to have children. I do not want to be a grandfather. I do not want them to, I do, do not want them to be burdened with children. I do not want them. And they're going to have, you know, and they're going to have to, it's hard for them. They have to work it out for themselves. Obviously, they're going to just do whatever they do. Yeah. Um, whether I want them, whether I want it or not. Um, but I try to explain to them um, as often as I can why I've got that position and it's tough for them and they have yeah. to make up their own minds. And they, you know, it's, it's, it, the thing is, it's, it's, a, in some ways, it's a very, it's a very depressing idea because it, it, it's, it basically put, puts, it, it, it's like, it's like throwing water on the fire of hope, you know, that, yeah. that, that, that we all sort of live in this strange denial that, you know, it's going to get better, it's going to get better, and, but it's not going to get better. <laughs> in fact, it goes the other way. We're all, we're, we're, we're all going to fall apart and die. Yeah. Um, and so it's, you know, it's quite a, it's quite, yeah, it's quite a difficult in, in that point, from that point of view. And it's also, on the other hand, Sometimes I feel like, with regards to my children, although it's that, you know, although society and the general people might think how shocking it is that I tell my children I don't want to have children, I also sometimes feel like that, that compared to my children's friends' parents, I feel that I'm coming from a place, place of, of, of more compassion. Yeah. Uh, because a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of my, fr- my children's friends' parents... Um, want to have children because they want to be able to give them back after having fun with them. Yeah. Which is like really like quite, it's quite nasty when I think about it. That's really awful. Like, why do you want your children to have to deal with all the horrible bits and you just get the nice bits? Why, why have them? Why, why would they have them at all? Um, And I want to protect my children from, from that. I want to protect them from, I want to protect my grandchildren from coming into existence yeah. So that they don't have to have, you know, they don't have to have all these needs and deal with and, and the risk, the risks of them being mentally ill, physically ill are so high. Yeah. So, so high. 
that I just don't want them to do that for the sake of the grandchildren and, and for the sake of my children. Right. Um, and so it, it, it certainly presents a very challenging yeah. uh, reality and it goes up and down. And, you know, sometimes they might say, I don't want to speak to you about it. Um, sometimes, they, I mean, my, my youngest one, you know, sometimes throws it at me. If anything's going wrong, said, well, you had me, you know, you're, you, you've done this to me. Um, and, you know, I have to deal with that. Yeah. Um, so it, it's really, really changed, changed, changed my life. And it's changed what I speak about and what I do out in public. And I, I, I think that it's, I think that the, the, the scope for the, I mean, the scope for the art and st- is magnificent yeah. it's just endless yeah. it's yeah. endless absolutely so i completely agree with you about the art and um there's no question you're in a you're i mean you're in a difficult situation and a unique yeah well i've known other antenatalist parents but it's a it's a difficult situation to be in i mean i, I yeah it, it is difficult and and you know it's um i think i think my my children are very very intelligent yeah. um and you know, I think that they have the, the the capability to see to see past it, as to, and to see that it's actually a very compassionate yeah. idea, um, and they'll have to choose to do what they do with it. Um, but yeah, it is it is tricky, definitely very very tricky. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you read a lot of books and articles about antenatalism, or do you primarily watch videos on the subject? I mean, how do you? I primarily observe? watch. I, I primarily watch videos and I still haven't read um, the full David Benatar book or books um, because a friend of mine's got, got them and he hasn't given them to me and I haven't, so I haven't just haven't got down to reading them. So yeah, I do have a couple of few books at home. I've got every cradle is a grave and a, a, a history of antinatalism. Yeah. And I sort of dip into those um, and I do read articles occasionally, but I mainly watch videos Um yeah, mainly watch yeah. videos. There was actually there was an interesting guy who I would like to get hold of, um, who got banned. He was on for but just a couple of weeks. You must have seen him. I can't remember what he was called. He was Recently, like, he had a guy who had a hat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the the points that he made, but I, I, you know, so for example, one of the points that he made was that antinatalism is the end of philosophy. Yeah. Did you remember that? I didn't. I did see that. that. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I thought that was, again. I thought he was very powerful and very convincing. Yeah. Um, with his arguments, um, but I, but, you know, but I intend I intend to read books about it as well. Um, you know, uh, definitely David Benatar. I need to read, and perhaps some of some of the other ones that are available. Well, you probably should check out Confessions of an Antinatalist by Jim Crawford because of course yes. Jim Crawford yes. also. I have, I've dipped into that yeah. as well. Yeah, it's yeah. an excellent yeah. one. Yeah. Um, um, how does your antinatalism intersect for you with other subjects such as atheism, veganism, and the right to die? Okay. So I, I would say that um, I'm not 100% sure about anything, and so I have to leave the door open to a certain extent. But if, if I have to call myself anything, I'd call myself an anti-theist. Okay, sure. Now, um, since I've become, yeah. So I, I just think what, you know, whatever or however this this world was created must have been created by some kind of dark force or autistic force or some strange i don't know what you could even call it um a bit like the the gnostics saying it was created by demiurge Mm -hmm. so that's what i would say in terms of, of god or the creator um in terms of veganism yeah, I mean, it, it relates to, to veganism. I, I'm opposed to all, uh, all breeding of all sentient life. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there's no need to do it. Um, and yeah, it's, I mean, in, in, a, in a way, again, I, I, it, will, it, it, it does relate to these things, but it's in, in, in a way for me, it, it, it overrides them all. Yeah. Um, and then there was the other one was the right to die. Yeah, and yeah. again, seems to me, pretty obvious that we should have the right to end our lives especially given the fact that we didn't have the right we didn't have we didn't give consent to to begin our lives so we should definitely be able to end our lives um but you know we should i mean 
<laughs> it doesn't work like that um, because the people that get to the top are usually the uh, the absolute dregs of society. People yeah. are controlling it, the whole thing, or the dregs of society, and and that's all part of DNA and nature and nurture, and that's all part of the problem. Which is again the fact that the fact that we don't have the right to die yeah. is another reason to be an antinatalist. Absolutely, you shouldn't bring someone into you shouldn't bring someone into existence. Yeah, knowing that there's a chance that they might want to die yeah. and that they can't. Couldn't have said it better, you know, absolutely. It, it's, been argued, you know, it, it's been argued that, you know, at least if, at least if you, you know, if it was really very, um, maybe easy is the wrong word, but, it, but if, if it was possible and, and not too difficult to end one's life and it wasn't looked down upon, yeah. Then, then maybe you could say, okay, I'll bring some without consent, uh, but they can just, you know, they can just get rid of their, themselves and it's no, you know, they can end their lives and there won't be any problem there. They won't leave any, you know, if society maybe, if society had an attitude that death was a wonderful release and everything and society wouldn't look down on people, then maybe, yeah. But the fact that you can't, you can't, you can't end your own life, again, that just that, that another reason not to bring someone into existence. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm pretty sure the first time I heard about you was your response video to my, my annual contest, the Why Are You an Antinatalist contest. I think it was the 2018 or 2019 edition. Um, and you described yourself as yeah. a reproduction skeptic, which I thought was a very interesting term. Um, not, a, not, a, not a term, I, I, I don't know if you still use that term. Um, but in, in some of your older videos, you do make references to uh, vehement the voluntary human extinction movement and I think it was you know sort of around the time you were kind of formulating you know your your antinatalism um so just I'm just curious what your thoughts are on what are often considered sort of the four schools of antinatal thought there's child free antinatalism proper vehement and ethylism so what do you think about all those individually um okay um well I mean, child, I, I don't really know a lot about the differences between them, but yeah. child-free, I, I assume that people who are child-free sometimes do it for different reasons. Yeah. They don't necessarily do it because they think it's wrong to bring a child into existence. But the fact that they've done it, that they haven't brought children to existence is the important thing. It doesn't really matter why to a certain extent, although when they speak to their friends and family, you know, it would be good if people would explain that they shouldn't be doing it, you know, or that they or bring up these questions. Um, just to go back to the point you were saying about calling myself a reproduction skeptic. Yeah. One of the things, one of the things that perhaps we'll speak about shortly um, is that, and that we, you and I have spoken about and other people as well, um, is that I, I, one of the dreams that I have is to be involved in a, in, in a, in, in a really strong branding exercise yeah. where, where this antinatalism or perhaps another word um, is branded and put into public space and yeah and it can be made really interesting and sexy and young and you know um and and therefore i i the the, I, the, the words reproduction skeptic came into my mind because they're sort of less it's it's less harsh in a way than antinatalism. Yeah. It, it's spreading skepticism with the whole question, and I think that there would be a lot of people who are who are to some extent reproduction skeptics, so skeptical yeah. about reproduction. If you were to ask them, you know, they they probably most people would agree that certain groups of people would be better off having less children. Yeah. You know or that we'd all be better off having less children and that people who live in war zones would be better off having less children and people who's p people who've got some really serious health issues in their in their genetic makeup should be you know careful about how many or if, if any having children right so there's many many people who would be skeptical about certain groups or, or under 15 year olds yeah i think most yeah. people would say they they really shouldn't be having children right of course. so so I was, you know, I, I was thinking that along the terms of, I don't know if antinatalism is the right word or not. I'm not sure. I, I've mixed feelings about it. Because yeah, it's, yeah. It's, anti it's like, um, it, it, it's because I think, I think a part of, uh, I think a part, for me anyway, I don't know whether you'd agree with this, but I think a part of, of these ideas leads to um, the idea that actually, even though it's, even though 
it's very unappealing to the chimp. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Nothingness is actually very appealing. It's very nothing. Appealing. It, one of the things that I, one of the, the slogans that I want to put out there is that nothing is better than everything put together. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so, uh, and in a way, uh, we, uh, we uh, antinatalists haven't seemed to coin a word that, right. that, that is saying, actually, it's the, the great nothingness, the great void. That's what we're, you know, that's what we're looking forward to. And that's what we, uh, you know, we, we would rather not have been disturbed from it. Right, yeah. right. And, and so, you know, rather, as opposed to antinatalism, which is, an, you know, antinatalism, which is an, uh, against. Yeah. But I, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. It's, it, it's just that, you know, I think it'd be, it'd be an interesting conversation as to how you would market this idea best. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so back to your question about these, these groupings. So child-free, well, you know, I'm unfortunately not able uh, to be in that group. Um, <laughs> um, then there's the um, antinatalists, which which I am able to be in. Yeah. There is um, I, I, there's the voluntary human extinction movement, um, which you know I I I I think it's worth visiting their website. They've got some quite. It's not a great website. And it needs some work. And to, they've got some good look. stuff on there though. But they've got some really good stuff on. Yeah, there. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's some really good stuff to work through. And then there's Ephelism, which is um, based on the work of um, Gary, otherwise known as in Mendham. Um, and uh, what, I, I, what he says makes a lot of sense to me. Um, yeah. You know, um, the red button question, the green button question, um, they, they make a lot of sense to me. And yeah, I, 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 it, yeah it makes a lot of sense to me, Ephelism. You know, he's got some great ideas and yeah um i particularly like the guy what well, i always forget his name great Cho, the guy that great um, yeah 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 he's uh, maybe you'll put that in the uh, in his description in the description he takes yeah, sure gary's stuff and makes it into really lovely pieces little little bit sections with yeah music in the background and great does I amazing really work like those yeah, yeah it's great absolutely stuff. You are currently the most subscribed to antinatalist on YouTube. So congratulations for that. It's amazing. Uh, which, you know, it is incredible. Um, of course, you have... That's this actually not actually true. That's oh, who, actually not true. No? no there okay. is someone more, more subscribed to you, but he's not... Well, he's not... I don't know if he admits that he's an antinatalist, but he mm. hasn't denied it in a way, or maybe he has. And that is Cosmic Skeptic. He's got, my, he's got more... <laughs> he's okay. not an activist. Sure. He's not an activist, but he is. But he basically hasn't denied, really. He, he kind of is an antinatalist. He kind of is. Maybe I don't know, <laughs> but but you might be. You might be a hundred percent right about. But that. But anyway, yeah, it's sure. good that right. he. It's good that he's been. You know that he's covered the subject and. Yeah, um, yeah. We'll see if anyway, he continues. Yeah. But as yeah. an as an activist, I'm definitely definitely got the most uh, the most subscribers. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, definitely. Of course, you have this also this long history of speaking about all these other subjects as well on your channel and on the street. So what has been the reaction um, of your older fan base to the inclusion of all this antinatalism all of a sudden in your videos? Yeah, um, it's funny you should say that because one of the thing, one of the many things that I would like to do, or I'd like to get, I'd, I'd like, I'd, I'd quite like other people to do this actually. Yeah. Maybe they can get in touch with me if they're interested is to go through some of the comments of the videos because I love the comments. I love reading the comments. They're really interesting. Yeah. And um, the comments, you know, I do get comments. Oh, when are you going to, you know, when are you going to give this a rest? When are you going to get onto the next thing? This, uh, I really like what you're doing, Danny, but this antinatalism business is too much. And, yeah. you know, so I do get quite a fair bit of that. And then I also get, you know, some people who really get it. Um, yeah. You know, I was t today in Brighton, there was a guy there who came to see me. He, he knew I was going to be there. And he, he said that he was on, you know, he was on board with it. And it made perfect sense to him. So it's excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it would be good to have people commenting on your videos or that project that you just said, because not only are you getting comments, you're getting a lot of comments. I mean, you get engagement, yeah. which is phenomenal. 
Um, so yeah, I'd like to see that as well. Um, I'm, cur I'm curious about how people within the antinatalist community have responded to you and your work. Um, do you find that there's been a lot of support for what you do? Do you encounter a lot of pushback? I know that there are a lot of antinatalists out there that have little to no patience for antinatalist parents. So I'm, cu I'm curious if you've encountered, you know, much prejudice in antinatal circles. Yeah, very, very little. I've had okay, one or two people you know, who are really, really, you know, just mean. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. I don't take any notice of that because, yeah. you know, that, that's, that's, yeah, it's fine. That's, that's their stuff. You're I was tough. thinking actually, uh, I think a lot about, about, yeah, and I was thinking a lot of, I think a lot about this whole subject and think a lot about how to move forward. And I do think, I don't know if you agree with me on this, I do think that, that, that there is a lot of potential for antinatalists to get together because oh, yeah. I think that as a, as a, as an idea, you know, I, I think we can really unify ourselves because it doesn't make any difference to me, whether you're religious, not religious, spiritual, not spiritual, black, white, whatever, poor, rich, yeah. it doesn't make any difference to me. If you, if you understand the principle of antinatalism, then I feel a connection uh, to, to you and, I think that, that I think there's a lot of potential of unifying people uh, around this idea, and it's not like anything else. You know, most thing, most other things, veganism to a certain extent, but you know, other things, it's it's really difficult to 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 get together with people around other ideas because there's so much diversity and so you know, in and different and conflicts of opinions and ideas. But this is so simple. Um, that it, it really can be a unifying force. I agree completely. And we are unbelievably diverse um, as a community. I mean, there's antinatalists everywhere, every walk of life. And, you know, the size of some of these, you know, Facebook groups in Lebanon and Egypt, and, you know, I just found one from Kuwait the other day and Afghanistan. So, you know, we're everywhere. We're all shapes, sizes, colors, languages, and so I agree with you 100% uh, on that entirely. I mean, I think you are quite gifted in this um, argument or arguing antinatalism with religious people. Um, and some of these arguments you make, especially to Christians about how, you know, there really it doesn't make sense for Christians to be natalists that it's sort of everything in the Bible or, or the life of, of, of Jesus Christ points to antinatalism or a kind of antinatalism and that argument from what i understand and i'm 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 less of a antinatalist historian than i'd really like to be but from what i understand that does have uh, a historical antecedent like appa apparently Kier uh, kierkegaard was very very upset <laughs> you know that priests were um you know, there's any possibility of them marrying and having children because to be christ-like um you shouldn't procreate you know, essentially, right. and that's, you know, um, so I, you know, and I, I think it's, um, it's often thought of as this like impossible thing to get through to religious people with this subject. Um, but some of the what? conversations you've had with, I mean, are just amazing. So go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, certainly within my, tr tr the tradition that I was brought up with, which is um, Orthodox Judaism, there is that, there are actually some really interesting quotations uh, in the Bible and the yes. Talmud um, about antinatalism, and it, it, you know there, there, there is a part in the bit in the Talmud that says it's better than to never have been born. Yeah. Um, so there are, you know, there are there there are places in in the text. I wouldn't be surprised if there are some there are some Islamic texts that also have that. Yeah. I don't know. I haven't really looked into it. But I've, I actually, I haven't got, I haven't put it up yet, but I have got a, a similar conversation I had in Speaker's Corner just a few days ago um, with a Muslim and saying, you know, what, what happens if your child goes to hell? And he, he just wasn't really getting what I was saying, but it, but it, but it was, uh, I'll put it up there for you to see. Yeah, so yeah. yes, I mean, you can, you can argue this, this argument just goes across to me. It's so compelling and it can, you know, it can be used in all sorts of di uh, situations, all sorts of different, different people. Yes, absolutely. 
so yeah, thank you for your thoughts on that. So you recently had a TikTok video of you go quite viral. Uh, last time I looked at it, it was well over 2 million views. So again, congratulations on that. How on earth did that happen? Do you know the person that put up this video? Yeah. He just came across me in the street and uh, put it up there. Wow. Uh, and it's had, other, it's had more, it's had a few other million hits on wow. KSI's on some, someone called KSI. I've never heard of them. It's the young people's. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it was just, he, 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 you know, he managed to film it and he put some words to it. He made it into a nice little TikTok. Um, what was interesting, very interesting about that. And, and, uh, is, is that, is that the comments in that? which were mainly young people, yeah. were incredibly supportive. They yeah. were just like, on the whole, wow, yeah, he's right. Yeah, we should sue our parents. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, I didn't ask to be born. <laughs> I mean, so that was quite interesting. I mean, on the other hand, these people are being exposed to some horrific stuff. I mean, TikTok yeah. is just terrible. It's just absolutely terrible. Yeah. And these people are being subjected to such horrible, obnoxious stuff. That you know, just to happen, they happen to write the old comment there. But on the other hand, I do think that there is that those should be, in a way, certainly part of the target market, young people. Yes, yes. Getting there early um, <laughs> before they do it. Um, so um, yeah, that was really it was quite it was quite uh, uh, inspiring to see how many young people really got it and enjoyed it. So just a little bit uh, more about the TikTok thing. So it probably yeah. probably is the most viewed antinatalist video in existence at the minute, which is amazing. Um, the other thing too, is that there have been quite a few instances of little videos popping up on TikTok um, of very young people basically expressing an antinatalist point of view without knowing the word. So that's been fascinating. I mean, it does seem like, you know, this younger generation, some of them at least are sort of getting it, which is, which is great. So I think that, that must have something to do with why your video really blew up. I mean, it, it probably, there probably is something there. Like we probably should be creating more TikTok content. And I have to admit, like I loved Vine, <laughs> which I probably shouldn't admit. So, you know, it's, it's shitty content maybe, but I, I, I like it. <laughs> well, I've got one of, one of the plans that I actually think I will put into action is a friend of mine has a, a 90 year old mother. Oh, who, wow. This friend I was talking about, uh, yeah. who, who himself is an antinatalist, yeah. as a 90-year-old mother who is an antinatalist as well. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of making some TikTok videos um, with her. Just oh, yeah. Her. She's, and she's just going to absolutely belt her out. And, you know, you, you can't really challenge a 90-year-old woman when she's telling people they shouldn't be procreating. Right. And she is a grandma. <laughs> oh, that's going to be amazing. Those, that, those kinds of videos do go super viral yeah. of like, yeah. you know, much older people, you know, going nuts on I, camera. I've already, I've already created, I've already uh, ordered her, her, her props, her, her costume, which is um, uh, one, of her, one of her slogans that she, kept, that she came out with. Uh, I've got to put it on a t-shirt for the, for the TikTok videos and it says, uh, sterilization for the nation. It's one of her. Nice. Okay. I'll be looking forward to those. That's great. <laughs> I'm excited to hear about that. Um, uh, well, I think, I think this is a good segue into sort of our next uh, grouping of topics. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the role of comedy in antinatalist activism. So um, I think it's safe to say that while our methods are maybe a little bit different, um, I think both of us are sort of you know, often playing from the same uh, page of the same version of the same, you know, anti-natalism activism, activism strategy handbook where we're, you know, clearly combining our anti-natalism, our activism and outreach with some form of comedy uh, and, and certainly art. Um, so, you know, do you consider yourself a comedian on any level? Yeah. Obviously, there's this huge tradition of British comedy and it's hard sometimes listening and not, you know, considering you a, a real part of that. Seeing the inspiration of it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't really think about myself as anything. I just do what I do. Um, uh -huh. You know, it's, and what I do, or what I have done so far, and maybe it'll change, but what I have done so far is basically stand-up comedy on the street. Yeah, yeah. What it is, you know, I just pitch up somewhere and, you know, they become the audience and that's what it is. And what I love about it is that I don't, 
because I'm not in a venue, I don't have to be funny. Yeah. I can be serious sometimes. Right. And I'm not, there's not an expectation for me to be funny yeah. uh, from the crowd. They don't know what's going to happen. Um, so, yeah, but, but I don't like, I don't think of myself as a, anything really, even an antinatalist. I'm just me with some ideas. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Um, I mean, do you have a background at all in, you know, musical or performing arts theater? Have you ever taken some of these performances and put it in a different setting, like on stage or anything of that nature? Well, I have. I, I certainly have because my whole career, uh, which basically ended with COVID, uh, was to provide music for functions, weddings, okay. bar mitzvahs. So uh, I've been doing that type of performance, but it's very different. Um for many, many years, although, as I said, um, that has been totally destroyed by, by this virus, which is okay. fine because I've been, I had been in that business for a long time, probably a little bit too long. The, the impact on the performing arts has been you know, devastating. Yeah. So I'm sorry to hear yeah, that. Um, the role that art and comedy play in antinatalism, antinatalist activism is very controversial, particularly amongst antinatalists who never seem to know what to make of these types of uh, alternative approaches and are often very put off by people like you and me trying to engage non-ANs through anything that isn't like hard, sterile, logical arguments. Um, can, you t can you tell me a little bit about why you think this kind of approach is so important uh i'm not sure i think anything is important but um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um um definitely not anything you know definitely not me um but i i mean it, it's important for my own sanity you know I, yeah I, yeah i i have i i have my 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 friendships my main friendships um, a lot of the conversations that I have are, are full of the darkest humor ever you could imagine. Yeah, yeah. some of which I can't couldn't possibly put on, on uh, in, into the public space. And, and the reason, and sometimes I get, in, like, I get into real trouble with my, particularly my 13 year old, uh -huh. um, who's been brought up in this whole politically correct nonsense. Yeah. Um, you know, if I but but the way I deal with the darkness um, is is through the humor and the comedy. And, yeah. and that, I think that's a really big, you know, it's a big part of, of sharing these ideas, which which are, you know, which have a very big, you know, very dark side to them. Yeah. Um, and, it's, you know, it's heavy what, what, what is being said here. Um, but but if it's done in a way of laughter and, and you know, and being and humor. And it, it lessens the blow and it opens the doors of people's perception as well. Yeah. It's very difficult to argue with. It's very, it's very difficult to argue with, 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 the com with, with, with comedy. Right. I mean, I've, right. Se I've seen people do it. I've seen people. Uh, there's a guy, what's his name now? Kane. His surname's Kane. Um, Russell Kane, I think he's a comedian. Yeah. And I've mm -hmm. seen him do it. He, he's done a lot of comedy about the COVID situation. Okay. And it was quite interesting watching me because. His, his, uh, his kind of approach or attitude towards COVID is very different to mine. He was much more, uh, seemed to be much more into the mainstream, at, certainly at the beginning, and he was making fun of people who were breaking the rules. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it's very difficult to argue with that kind of thing, <laughs> even though I could argue with it. I could argue with right. the, the fundamentals of it. I don't, don't agree with his approach. But, um, but, but, when he, but when he was doing it with comedy, he was, it's, very, it's very powerful. It's very difficult to argue with it. Yeah, uh, yeah. So for me, it, it, you know, for me, it's, it's an important part of my being able to deal with uh, heavy subjects is to deal yeah. with them with humor. I mean, if I can explain just sort of why I think it's so important is that I think there are so many people on this planet that, are not going to be able to engage with these ideas at all if you don't present it in some sort of comedic kind of way. Like that is the only way in for a lot of people. And I think like if you're an antinatalist and you're, you know, you want to prevent births and, you know, your main objective is to prevent, you know, philosophy professors <laughs> from having kids, <laughs> then like, then like, sure, you know, nothing but asymmetries and, and hard philosophy. But for, 
the man on the street or the young person or, you know, just normal people, like you kind of have to, you have to put this sort of scrim, you know, in front of the whole thing, not, not to hide it, but just to sort of make it, I, I want to stay away from words like palatable because I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure <laughs> the way that you and I do it is palatable. <laughs> like to most people, I don't, you know, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I am, abr- I'm abrasive in my own ways, you know, in, in my, uh, my antinatalist comedy. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I think that it is often the only way that you can get people to be consumers of antinatalism uh, at this stage of the game, at least um, yeah. for a lot of people. Yeah. And, and yeah. And, and, and for me uh, anyway, uh, it, you know, it's what I love doing and it's what comes very naturally to me and I wouldn't yeah. have it any other way. Why would I? Right. You know, I don't mind having, I don't mind having intellectual conversations with people about, about the ideas, but um, I love the comedy about, and, 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 and it's so pregnant. There's so much comedy out there. There's so much creativity, there's so many things yeah. that can be done um, that, um, yeah, why not? That it, that's the only thing that antinatalism is pregnant with. It's comedy. and we're the ones giving birth to it i guess yeah Um, (laughs) so so now i think that's a good segue into talking about some of these projects i guess um so dandy you and i have talked quite a lot uh, 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 in the past about you know various projects that that you've had in mind to do around the subject of antinatalism uh you have a lot of interesting you know big picture ideas you really do so i want to talk to you a little bit about at least a few of these uh let's start with with two of them that i do i do admit scare me just just a little bit to some extent so one of them that you've talked to me about in the past is you want to start some sort of antinatalist commune of sorts. I'm not sure if that's exactly a fair word to attach to it, commune, um, but an actual place where antinatalists like can live and be with one another, um, which again does 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 worry me to some extent. But I, I'd love to you know hear you explain that idea a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if that's just a pipe dream. I don't know if it will ever happen. I think it would need some money behind it. If, yeah, um, but. I think it would be interesting to create a different culture and, yeah. and you know, antinatalism is in a way a bridge to a different culture, different yeah. way of living. Um, and, you know, it would, I think it would be very interesting having an experimenting with living together and creating that different culture and creating education um, for young people and for older people and for creating together, living together in a, in a space that is respectful towards some of the basics of antinatalism, which I, I think, you know, would probably be, um, it, would prob- it would probably be a space that was, uh, that, 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 that was vegan or along yeah. those lines of being vegan. Um, yeah. And I imagine it being also a space of, of it being um, to some degree in, 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 other, in, in, in in some people's understanding, minimalistic. I think sure. minimalism also yeah. is a you know goes along with it. Um, although I'm not, I'm definitely no poster boy for minimalism by any means. Um, but, but I think it would be, I think yeah, I think it would be a wonderful thing to create a, a, a physical space where we could develop and live together and create a new culture. I I I think though though before that, I think yeah. what I what what I mentioned earlier on and what i would like really like to see is um is is some kind of uh, place where people can go a really well designed website um a resources website um a really i, I think a possible powerful branding of of antinatalism or or another word it might be called i i was thinking i, I thought of the idea of utopia being where utopia literally means no place. Uh-huh. So you could have utopians who, who worship nothing, worship okay. the great nothingness, right? Um, so, and, you, and, and then you've changed, instead of being antinatalist, you're pro-nothingness, utopia. Um, but I mean, that's something for discussion. That, that's just a detail, but I, I, think it would be, I think it would be great to get some money behind it all, to get some celebrities behind it. I think, yeah. I think it's possible. I think it's possible to find child-free celebrities and child-free um, uh, wealthy 
people who don't have children and to, to fight, work our way, network through that, through people. I mean, I can do it myself because I have a connection with people, with all sorts of people yeah. Uh, yeah. in my community and just, just, I just happen to have those connections and I could network through those people to see if I can eventually find um, people that can come behind and to create, to create uh, some, some kind of resources so that we can um, put lots of projects into, into action. Yeah. And um, the various projects that I, you know, that I, that I, that th those projects could be sort of um, a mixture of creative comedic projects and also serious projects. Yeah. So for example, um, what I really like about Raphael Samuel uh, is that he's part of this child free India movement, yeah. which is, which is a serious political um, organization. Well, I don't know if it's an organization, but a serious political group who are, um, you know, who are trying to put forward ideas to help reduce the people, you know, the population in India. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I think that, that it has, I think that uh, antinatalism, and I have, I have many ideas about how antinatalism could be uh, introduced into politics. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and which, which I, I've, there's been, there have been attempts in the past yeah. Um, I also think that um, I also play with the idea, this is more of a, a sort of creative idea, um, of there being, uh, you know, a new religion. Um, and yeah. I've sort of spoken about that in my films, you know, where, where there's instead of the Ten Commandments, it's just one commandment, thou shalt not reproduce, finished, right. that's it, right? Um, a very simple, uh, very simple religion to be part of. That's all you need to do. Right. It's nothing. <laughs> um, so I think that that's interesting. As I said, political. I think that that I, I started this idea of the expiry party, but I didn't yeah. really set it up. I yeah. didn't really set it up. It was just a Facebook group. I, I think it would be interesting if other people, not necessarily me, but other people, um, started working on that. And maybe again, maybe it'd be important to have some kind of funding behind it all to be yes. able to push it out there. Yeah. Um, so th those are, those are a couple of ideas. Um, I think that, um, I think, again, I think we need to get young people involved, yeah. cool, hip young people involved. And, and we could, if we get them some good materials, they could give out condoms yeah. on the street and spread the ideas of antinatalism. So they'll get a nice leaflet, a nice shiny leaflet and a nice little condom with all sorts of things on it, you know, yeah. all sorts of funny slogans. There's endless amounts of things that can be done. Yeah. And, um, and then, you know, people could, maybe there'd be a resource on the website where people could order these things and give them out wherever they are and become antinatalist um, activists because it, it can be a lot of fun if you, you know, you do oh, it right. Oh God, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, uh, you know, it, as I said today, um, you know, one of the things that I think we could sell antinatalism with is like, if you become an antinatalist, basically you'll, ne you'll never be dull at a party anymore. <laughs> yeah, you know, you true. Bring up, you bring up that subject anywhere. Yeah. Right? There's, you know, it's such a great subject to bring up. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. And you bring it up once and I mean, they go to, they go to you next party to start having yeah. the conversation. I've, yeah. I've been in that situation. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. It 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 has this way of obsessing people a little bit. Like they just yeah. want to keep on talking about it, or they don't want to talk about it at all. <laughs> it's the other reaction. But yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, so many, so many great projects that you have in mind. I mean, I'm definitely, I'm. De I mean, I'm definitely on board with at, at least most of that, if not <laughs> all of it. Uh, I mean, when I say like, oh, this makes me a little nervous. I mean, there is like, I think there is a bit of a danger in combining the concept of antinatalism with religion. But I also know you sort of you're sort of meaning it in a totally different way. Like you're not, yeah. you're not, you're not proposing that it become the next Christianity. I mean, you're, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a more no, but I, performative. I quite like it though. I quite like it to become the next Christianity. <laughs> Why not? Well, if, uh, you know, if, nice if and, it's, it's a lovely religion it's nice and easy. You don't have to honor your parents. <laughs> you don't have to, you, you can commit adulteries. You can eat what you like and do what you like. All you need to do is make sure you don't, procreate <laughs> what a wonderful religion 
Well, if, if what uh, you and Kierkegaard are saying about Christianity is true, then it, it, it's already antinatalist, isn't it? <laughs> there, are, there, are, there are antinatalist quotes that Jesus was meant to yes. have said. Yes, yes, I've, I've heard those. I've, I've not seen them recently, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, let me just ask, I mean, are there any other, you know, big projects that you, that you have in mind? Oh, I've got lots and lots of projects that I have in mind. Um, I know you do. But, uh, I mean, I'd like to do, um, I'd like to offer, um, I'd like to offer like antinatalist sort of therapy, um, just to be listening ear to antinatalists, because I think that's, I think it could be quite difficult for antinatalists to think to go to therapy yes. and then to have a natalist therapist. Yeah. Um, so I, I'd like to quite kind of offer that, but um, I wouldn't do it on a paid basis. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd like to do antinatalist tours. Yeah, I'd like to go around London, taking people around London from an antinatalist point of view, take them to hospitals, take them to really bad areas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> take, them to, take them to Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> That would be fascinating. There's one uh, idea that you've recently had, one project that you that you began that I, I'd like to talk a little bit about, and that is the Fellowship of Antinatalist Artists. Um, so the, the Fellowship of Antinatalist Arget- Artists is a project, a collaboration between yourself and Antinatalist Outreach, who's a fellow YouTuber and a, a mutual friend of ours. Um, and uh, so what can you tell me about this project and what, you, what your ideas for it are? Well, my ideas was to create a fellowship for people who wanted to get involved with creating antinatalist art. We had a few meetings and then I kind of felt like I didn't want to be running it anymore. Um, but but I'm, still, I'm still open to collaboration. And we've got, we, I think we started one project of doing some drawing and... and um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and because I think that, you know, I think that collaboration, I've, I've always found it hard to know how to go about collaborating. Yeah. And I, so I tried setting this up. Um, I think what I'm, what I'm having said that and having done that, and I'm, as I'm happy, still happy to be part of it, I think what I, what I am going to be moving into more of is to see if I can, I can get together groups perhaps on, on Telegram or, or WhatsApp yeah. or whatever, but groups of people who want to help me in the projects that I'm involved with. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I, that, that's for the future. Um, the other thing that I thought I, I thought of, which I, I only haven't shared with you or anyone, um, I thought that might be an, a nice idea, either an addition or even a change of the actual fellowship is I, I think it might be nice to create a kind of, it's a, 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 not not really a 12-step fellowship, but a fellowship that has some similarities with the 12-step program. Okay, okay. Um, mainly, the main similarity, which I think one of the things that I find that I really like about the 12-step program, and I've been to many meetings, hundreds and maybe thousands of meetings. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I find really therapeutic and, and, and really helpful and fascinating and I love is that the 12-step program encourages a lot of the meetings of the 12 step program, uh, what they do is that they share out the time of the meeting between the participants. Uh, each gets three, four, five, six minutes, depending on how long they've got and how many people. Okay. And they get to talk about various subjects which can be fixed beforehand. Um, and they get to talk uninterrupted and there's no crosstalk. Mm, mm. And that's a very powerful, it's a very powerful way of, of, of expressing oneself and being listened to where, whereby you're, you know, the people that are listening to you are not providing you any feedback about what you're saying. They're not allowed to, they're not providing you any solutions. They're just there to listen to you and yeah. you're just there to listen to them. And I think that would be, I, I, I think that would be very helpful and very therapeutic yeah. to, to all of us involved, to us to meet on a regular basis, maybe once a week, doesn't have to be more than an hour and if and if there are not that many people there it can be less than an hour and we just share and and every week we have a topic and we share you know for five minutes about that topic or about whatever we like and there are loads of great topics that we could share about from uh you know from um uh, ending your life to compassion to uh suffering um you know 
to why I'm an antinatalist. I mean, there's loads and loads and loads of different, uh, you know, uh, different sub, sub subjects and topics. Yeah. And that, that structure of, of, of listening to each other and of being listened to, uh, I think that would be a really, really good idea and really supportive of, of this growing movement of people who yeah. essentially, I think, are just very, uh, are on the whole, I might be wrong about this, but I think on the whole, the majority of people who get antinatalism are actually very sensitive people. Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah. I think so. Um, yeah. And and I think that that, that we, well, all of us, certainly and certainly sensitive people, can really benefit from that type of therapeutic fellowship where we get we get to share whatever we want to share in an anonymous way yeah it might even be without pictures but it could be with pictures but in an anonymous way along yeah. the lines of, of the 12-step program anonymity uh, um i think that would be very helpful therapeutic and very interesting yeah yeah so i did want to share with you one idea that I, i've had for the, a long time and let me just preface this by saying i would never in a million years you know, suggest that you do this with your family or anything of that nature or, you know, um, but, well, no, I I wouldn't though. I mean, but (laughs) this idea that I've had for a long time that sort of like, um, in a way, um, you know, your story and your reality, um, you know, is just in the fact that, you know, you, you are an antinatalist with a family. I've long wanted to see, um, like that brought into some sort of reality TV, kind of idea like i just think that would be so amazing and so i think people would be fascinated by that you know some sort of story where the anti where the father is an antinatalist or the mother is an antinatalist or the kids become antinatalists and like the way that the family kind of processes that and uh you know i don't know if it would (laughs) it's something that could last a full season maybe a mini series or something but the idea of of antinatalism as a part of the familial discourse um that that is part of i think i think that would be really fascinating i would love to see that yeah well i i would you know i would certainly speak to my family about it i don't know how much they'd be you know they'd be up for it but they might i think it would be very interesting to have conversations with all of my family you know bearing in mind especially that my wife as i said is a very 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 um, vehemently against my ideas yeah and my children have sort of had a whole mixture of feelings and thoughts about it yeah so yeah I mean it, that, that, I think that would be a great idea but I'm not sure I could get my family into it I might be able to uh, but maybe someone else someone watching this can that might be interested in doing that I, I mean, I don't, you know, again, this is why I'm saying I would never suggest it because I, I would certainly never wish to suggest something that would harm <laughs> harm you as a family unit. But I, I like the idea of presenting antinatalism as like a piece of what the modern family is, because I think it will be part of what modern families are and contend with yeah. and, and talk about. And the way, I mean, the way yeah. things are going in the world, yeah, you know, it's just, you know, there's so many potential problems and now with the covid thing it's just getting worse and worse and worse yeah. that, that i think you're right i think that that pe- many parents are going to start to tell their children yeah that this is just not it's just not a place to bring children yeah or the kids are going to go to them or with the kids it. are going to go yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. you're right yeah, yeah. No, absolutely yeah. sorry yes you're right the kids are going to go to them with it like we said like we saw on a tiktok right yeah right so 2021, the Real Housewives of Antinatalism. Let's, you know, it's like even if you even if you did it with actors, you know, just some sort of reality TV like kind of situation. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'm, I'm glad you like that idea. Um, all right, I want to talk a little bit about um, your arguments with Extinction Rebellion because yeah. I really feel, really and truly, like th- these are incredibly important videos, and I don't think they're getting nearly enough attention in the greater antinatal world um, because obviously Extinction Rebellion is huge. Uh, it's had this, ma- I mean, I love what, I love seeing the size of them and like what they've managed to, to grow. And I hope for us to be able to achieve something like that. Although I really don't want us <laughs> to do some of what they're doing. Um, you know, and obviously they stand in complete, um, they are the complete opposite of antinatalism and certainly ethylism. Um, but I, but again, I just, I love that you are having this dialogue with them. So 
can I just ask, like, how did you start to get involved with arguing with Extinction Rebellion? Um, how, did, how, did that, how did that concept happen? Well, it was happen? just, you know, well, I, I, because I go to a lot of protests okay. uh, and, you know, mess around with, with what's going on there and, you know, disrupt yeah. what's going on. And I find it very interesting going into, it, it's always very interesting going to protests and watching the people protesting shut me down <laughs> when they're trying to, you know, the, when they're doing exactly the same as me. Yeah, and it's all you know, and I often get, I often actually get a lot of police support from these. I, I, I didn't. Catch I've noticed it, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, I, but a policeman, like, I remember very clearly when the Extinction Rebellion were doing their big, you know, big one of their big things, and and um, and one of them was shutting me up, and this police officer just looked in absolute disgust. Said, what on <laughs> earth are you doing? Like, you, you're standing here, you know, rebelling and making all this fuss in the street and then someone else comes along and you shut him up you know there <laughs> so, uh, um this it's, it's very telling and very interesting yeah um, yeah but yeah i mean I, I i i saw it as an opportunity to ask people and ask them um why are you so against extinction well yes yeah. and uh, you know it's a <laughs> it's a question that that sort of gets left up in the air it it's not only that they're so against extinction but they just based on the conversations that i've seen you have with members it's like they're they're completely in the dark as to how to prevent it too you know it's like okay what we're gonna play some chess on a blanket and that's gonna be a lovely yeah. day for us or right. we're gonna all sway to the music this way and we're just gonna have a goddamn good time and i remember there's one video where you're arguing you know you got to stop reproducing you got to stop eating meat like those yeah. are, and, and she goes on this tirade to you about like, you know, how, well, how do you expect people to listen to you if what you're telling them to do is make these sacrifices? Something of that, right. I'm paraphrasing. And it's like, how can you conceptualize that you're going to prevent something like extinction without sacrifice? <laughs> like, right. how, how can you possibly be here in this moment, in this fight, if you don't think that change isn't going to mean you don't get to have your goodies, you know? Yeah. So you, I mean that's a, that's a, actually, that brings it actually brings us on to a point which I think is perhaps a point that I don't spend enough time on it's with my children for example even and with other people yeah um, and that and, and, it, and it's related to what's you know what's often thrown at me saying you know how can you, you it's all right for you you had three children and, and now you're telling us we can't have children um, and you know I think that that for many people um, not having children is a is a huge sacrifice yeah um and yeah that's just how it is it, it is yeah. a huge sacrifice and uh, and at the same time uh, i would say that actually unknowingly having children is also a huge sacrifice absolutely <laughs> yeah yeah and uh, and we don't you know we as parents don't really think about it properly we don't really have any idea what that means until it's done until we do it um so yeah that's just the nature of life itself and human life is that it's you know either way it's it's going to be sacrifice um, yeah but, uh, but but there is sacrifice and you know i don't i don't I, I want to just reiterate what i said at the beginning which is that um i have i had hours and hours and hours of incredible joy and pleasure and uh you know i love being around little children for <laughs> you know for for a limited period of time sure um, <laughs> but you know they are they can be you know they can be cute and yeah. funny and intelligent and happy and joyful and there's and there's lots of it, it's lovely and yeah. uh, but um you know as i said before as well um, it comes with all the other things and yeah. they grow up into adults with adult problems. Yeah. Um, and yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Um, you interviewed Roger Hallam. Very interesting interview. Um, have, has that relationship with him continued? I mean, I know at the end of that interview, there was some talk of doing some kind of collaboration. Like, I think at the time you were doing a lot with the expiry, expiry party. Um, so have you continued talks with him? Have you, have you I haven't, gotten, no. Yeah, I, yeah. 
Like, I haven't continued talk with him. I'm not really sure if he completely gets what I'm saying. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, because I think when some, when some, when the when the penny drops, I think you know, then you'll see. I, I, you, you see that in a person when the penny drops. I don't think the pennies drop with him. I think he's he sort of sort of understands. Yeah, maybe we need to stop reproducing, or we need to talk about. It, but that's not that's not his. You know, that's really not his main thing. Um, it's it sounded like and i could be wrong but it sounded sort of like his reaction was sort of yeah well, how the hell do i get people to do that right and i'm like well it is difficult <laughs> but isn't yeah. that you know if, if this is going to be your platform maybe yeah. you should look into it man you know so okay yeah interesting so is this is this a conversation you're continuing with other members of, of extinction rebellion do you argue i i that? haven't had i haven't had any real conversation maybe again i think one of the one of the many thoughts that i've had actually you remind me of it is is it, it, you know, and I don't really think about this probably enough and carefully enough, and maybe we should all think about this, it is the question of, you know, it, it, is the purpose, is our purpose, is my purpose, is our purpose to reach as many people as possible and to try and prevent as many people as possible from being brought into existence? If that is the purpose, then there's a big question about what's the most effective way to do that. Do you support Charities that are already doing things like that, you right. know, should we be concentrating on places where they have extremely high birth rates? Um, you know, and what should we be doing? What, yeah. what What's the best thing to do? And I don't have an answer for that necessarily. Um, I think it's an ongoing discussion. Absolutely. Yeah, it is the biggest, biggest question for us. And, and you know, and having said that, I, you know, to, to sort of, to sort of answer myself, uh, I think that, that that we, you know, I need to be, I need to try and find the strike the balance between being driven and and uh, and being very uh, passionate mm-hmm. about what I do, with also um, a certain amount of, uh, of you know of, how shall I say of of going easy on myself and not oh sure not, not yeah. expecting myself to like you know. Uh, save the world because i can't right. <laughs> you know right right yeah you do have to be um realistic and kind to yourself in this in this field <laughs> in in, yeah. in this in this activism because it is because there is literally no the weight of the world yeah exactly yeah. exactly especially when uh you know for us more sentiocentric minded people is not only the humans but there's also the animals and the, it 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 doesn't end you know I so know. it's yeah what, in your opinion, do you feel like antinatalists are doing right so far? I mean, what do you feel like antinatalism, antinatalists are doing wrong currently? What are the most important things that antinatalists should be doing right now, in your opinion? <laughs> <laughs> A strangely corporate question, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I unfortunately don't feel like I'm in the position to tell all antinatalists what they should or shouldn't be doing. Um, I think, we, you know, I think that there, that it, I think I've already covered it. I, I think it would be great if we could somehow get together and network and find people with money yes. and find people and find um, celebrities to get behind it. I think that yeah. would be really good. Yeah, definitely. Um, and 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 a really good, well managed, funky, slick website. Definitely. People could go to. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, you often say that you've, you know, you've changed your mind a lot about, you know, pretty much everything over the course of your life. Do you think that you'll eventually change your mind about antinatalism and veganism in the future? <laughs> Do you think that's a possibility? Well, I've already, I've, I have already changed my mind a little bit about veganism in that okay. I, um, I question whether someone who only eats things that are going to end up being thrown away yeah Mm -hmm. and includes meat and milk in that or alternatively someone that only eats meat and milk products from animals that have been in their own care and have not suffered you know and haven't been bred into existence one of those i i question whether whether let's take the first example i question whether someone who just eats 
who just just only eats food that's going to be thrown away and doesn't buy into the whole system, whether perhaps they are uh, morally speaking superior, so to speak, I don't really like to speak that, than yeah. than someone like me who doesn't eat meat, and milk, and and um, and fish, etc., but does go to supermarkets, which you know I can't. Part of me is disgusted by supermarkets yeah. some terrible places yeah uh, but i do go there and i do give them my money uh, even though i only buy things that are not that don't have any animals in them but i do give them my money and i want i wonder at times whether someone who eats those products that, that they're going to just go in the bin is better because they're not supporting yeah the whole ecosystem that involves all this animals whereas i am so that's one thing that i've changed my mind a bit about veganism which is why I I kind of rather not call myself a vegan anymore. I just, but, but I don't, I still don't indulge in those products and I still don't, right. you know, pretty much don't wear anything um, with, with animals in it. But yeah. So, but, but antinatalism, I mean, again, I, 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 I do want to leave a door open because, you know, I want to, uh, at least I, I want to kid myself <laughs> maybe I'm just kidding myself that I want, uh -huh. you know, that I want to be open to the truth. I'm not sure how much free choice we have anyway. Uh, uh, you know, so um, I don't know if I ha will have any free choice to be able to decide not to be an antinatalist anymore. I don't, I can't see, foresee the future exactly. Yeah. And it's possible that I won't be uh, anything's possible, but frankly, I mean, I've been into this idea now for, I think it must be coming up for three years. Yeah maybe two, three years. And I've been searching high and low for arguments against it. And I yeah. haven't found anything really that's at all compelling. Yeah. Maybe little bits and pieces here and there uh, about, um, you know, that, that we don't know what nothingness really is and that maybe we will never, there, there was a guy called, um, what's his name? Dilport. I can't remember what his name is. He mm. makes quite a lot of videos about um, antinatalism. He's, um, what's he called himself? Oh, um, I can't remember what his name is. But anyway, mm. he sort of goes on a whole long philosophical talk about, um, about how we're never, we're never going to go to nothing, actually, and that we're just going to transform into all sorts of different forms of, of life when we die, you know, when we're all... I don't know, some kind of argument which I thought was maybe okay. had some merit. But uh -huh. on uh -huh. the whole, I've hardly come across any arguments that, are, that have any merit against it. It just seems so unassailable uh, as, yeah. a, a, as an idea, um, and I have been, you know, I, I I have exposed myself to it to a degree, not necessarily to the greatest minds in the world, um, but I but I, you know, out on the street, I I expose myself the whole time to people and to their arguments, and you know, nobody's come up with an argument. And one of the one of the things that I've been doing is offering people a hundred pound prize if they can give yeah. me. Yeah, a good reason to reproduce, and nobody's come even close. Right, not even close. Yeah, I so don't think I can't. No. I I don't think it's going to happen, but it may do. I mean, it's certainly a pattern in my life of getting going from one thing to another. Yeah. I don't. I don't really think there's anywhere else to go once you once once you come across antinatalism and ethelism. Where where else is there to go? It seems yeah. like it's the end of philosophy, as, yeah. as I was mentioning before. Right. I think you're right. I think you're right. I mean, I've been at this 10 years now. I just don't think there's any, <laughs> there's any going back. Um, I, do, I just briefly, I want to touch on, I, I, I have often had the same, it doesn't tr trump, it's a difficult word to use these days, but it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, I don't feel like it's an argument against veganism, but I often do have the same kind of inklings about waste. Like waste is probably a little bit worse you know, to, to just to just waste the calories and the, the fact that it could feed somebody. Um, on the other hand, I don't think there's, you know, there's that many people in the Western world eating garbage, you know, so it's, I don't think it's the most... Yeah, uh, and yeah, they're not, they're, yeah. yeah they're not, there's very few people in the world who've got, who, who only eat, I mean, it's not garbage, but I'm saying yeah. who, who are really strict and only eat, um, you know, the meat or meat or milk that's going to be thrown away. Right. Um, and, and I, the reason why I don't, one of the reasons why I, I don't is uh, a, I don't need to. And B, uh, because I don't trust myself 
Um, oh, that, me too. You know, yeah. Yeah. If I started eating meat and milk, then I just eat it. I just, I just yeah. eat it all the time anyway. Yeah. I wouldn't be able to just hold myself back and only have it when it's going to be thrown away. So right. that's why I don't do it. That's why I don't do it too. Yeah. Because it was like very difficult for me to go vegan. Like I was so addicted to animal mm -hmm. products. I mean, most, yeah, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, just, it's, just, it's just the truth. It's embarrassing, but it's true. Um, yeah. Okay. So thank you for your thoughts on that. Yeah, I do agree. Um, so how do we get people to embrace sentient extinction, Danny? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, it's, it's interesting you say that because I get, I get, you know, I get asked that a lot, not in that particular way, but I guess, you know, when people say that, you, you know, but hold on a minute, if we don't, you know, if we don't give birth, if nobody gives birth, then we're going to go extinct, you know. And what I always say in those occasions is, on those occasions, is like, we are, each of us is going to go extinct. Yeah. And each of us is a species on, our, on its own, really, in a way. Yeah. So we are going to go extinct. Yeah. You know, it's just the thought that the, the next generation are not going to be there. Um, why is that such a terribly difficult thought? Because, because our DNA has been programmed to go on and on and on and on. Yeah. Um, I mean, again, your question, your question is coming from the assumption that, that, that that's what we've got to do. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and to an extent, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good idea to do it as much as possible. Um, <laughs> but, we, you know, it's, it's, I guess there's lots of ways of doing it, you know. Yeah. There, there's lots of different ways of doing it. There's doing it through comedy. There's doing it through politics, through education. Um, through organizations, through charities, um, lots and lots and lots of different things, lots of different ways to do it. Um, yeah. And I guess each person gets to choose what they want to do and how they want to do it, if they want to do it. Um, but it's, it, you know, I think it's also important to just keep in mind that you are, you know, that we are fighting the final frontier here. You know, we are fighting against... Uh, against everything really yeah um, nature and nurture and so yeah. it's it, you know it's even though th we've as I've said before several times I think that even though it's really once you get it it's so obvious yeah it's so unbelievably obvious but getting over that hurdle is something really quite formidable absolutely um, it, you know and the fact that it took me to, to like to age 50 to even find out about it in a world with internet yeah. yeah yeah the fact that i you know i was already sort of um out of the box 10 years ago 10 12 years ago and then yeah. it still took me another 10 years to find out about it is is you know is witness to the fact that um you know dna has done an absolutely amazing job <laughs> yeah of being the ultimate antenatal suppressor or <laughs> suppressor of antenatalism yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, very well said. Um, well, Danny, uh, let me ask you now. I mean, how can people support the things that you do? I mean, tell us about this. Uh, you have a recent Patreon, a new Patreon. So, yeah. Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Okay, so I've got Patreon, and the money used in, in the Patreon, and the money used that I get in the Patreon will be used for different projects I've got, for equipment, for condoms. I bought quite a lot of condoms and given them away, mm -hmm. and eventually I'd like to get custom made condoms um and for any other project that i do so that you can either be, become a patreon or a patron on there or you can um, donate through paypal and you can um i also take bitcoin and various other cryptocurrencies um i don't know again i don't know exactly what i'm going to be doing with it with this money but i will i will use it for good and, and for, for to support any of the antinatalist stuff that I'm doing. Um, and in terms of supporting, again, I, I still have to, uh, I have to find a way to um, enable people to join, uh, join in with me and collaborate with me. And st yeah. so far I, I haven't been so successful in that. And maybe that will change. I don't know. I think it will. I think it will. Well, there's definitely going to be a link to that in the in the description. You could you could join if you're on Facebook. Then you can join the Fellowship for Antinatalist Artists. 
there's a London antinatalist group that yes. uh, we have up for a while, but I hope we will meet up again. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, okay, so Danny, uh, you know, you and I have had little disagreements in the past, small ones, but um, if I can tell you uh, the thing that makes me the most angry about what you do, um, <laughs> it's that I'm not out there doing it myself. Um, you know, most would consider me a pretty ballsy antinatalist, uh, frankly, um, but uh, you make me and I think, I think many other people sort of a witness to the poverty of our own courage. Uh, and because of that, um, you know, I'm very, I'm very grateful to you. You want you make me want to be a better performer, a better human being, a better antinatalist activist. Um, so thank you for that. I mean, you are sort of a um, a unicorn of sorts in this community. <laughs> it's a community that's often very marred by how terrified we are of being open and, and outspoken about um, these things. And then there, and then there's you. And in many ways, <laughs> you do put uh, all or most of us to shame. So thank you for everything that you do. I'm not. I don't want to put you to shame. But when you come, that maybe you can come to England and you can come out on the streets and have some fun. I would, I would, I would go right now if I welcome. could. I would love it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Yeah. Maybe, maybe one day in the future, that'll be possible. Um, yeah. So anyway, thank you, Danny, for everything that you do. And thank you for all your time today speaking with me Pleasure. on the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Please subscribe to Danny Shine's YouTube channel, Social Experimentalist. Follow him on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and make sure to help support his Patreon. Links in the description. Attention! The next episode will be an extremely special edition of the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. Several massive announcements are on the way, so please don't miss this next episode. I wish I could say more, but for now, please just make sure to make a special reminder and keep an eye out for episode 23 of Exploring Antinatalism on November 15th. And while you're at it, also make sure to mark down November 29th as another important date. I know that doesn't make sense now, but it will soon. Thank you for listening to the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. Once again, this has been Old Fan. You can find me at Forever Wolf Films on YouTube, as well as keep up with my daily antinatalist news updates at Antinatal News on Twitter. Please follow the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and email me at exploringantinatalism at gmail.com. The podcast can be listened to on our YouTube channel, Exploring Antinatalism Podcast, as well as Buzzsprout, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. And proudly announcing, the official website for the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, www.exploringantinatalism.com, has been completed and it is gorgeous, designed by the amazing Visions Noirs. Please visit Visions Noirs at www.bionoir.com and check out more of his links below. Podcast artwork donated by the incredible Life Sucks. If you would perhaps like to purchase one of the new Exploring Antinatalism t-shirts by Life Sucks, please visit his Etsy page, www.etsy.com slash shop slash Life Sucks Publishing. All the best and bye for now.